What's up, folks? We're going to talk a bit about using Docker to power what is probably the most important part of your infrastructure, which is your database backend. I've been using Docker to power our production Postgres, Postgres instance for about a month and a half now, and it has been awesome. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about how you make something like that, uh, things to think about, pros and cons, that sort of stuff. Let's just jump right in. If you're not familiar with Docker, Docker is a container. This is the Docker way with containers on it. By the way, I'm available to do portraits and that sort of thing on commission. They will look just as good as this. You know, Docker is not virtualization, it's a container. Those are, those are different things. Think of a container as like an abstraction on your operating system's kernel. So it's running processes in a like a separate namespace. What that means is the performance will be virtually identical to running it on, on uh, bare metal. So the performance hit you can take sometimes the virtualization in say uh, KVM or, or VMware, you don't get with Docker but you still get a lot of the great benefits being to modularize your, your apps so they will run the same everywhere. So that's what Docker is. It, it's a very, very popular thing. And if you haven't used it before, there's some jargon and concepts in it, but it's not as complicated as you would think by looking at those, the jargon and, and, the, and the concepts. That's what Docker is. Docker has, uh, there's two things in it that you will get confused. Everyone does. You have images and you have uh, containers. Again, I'm available for commission. Uh, this original artwork, of course, is copyrighted. Try, don't, don't sell this no matter what they offer to give you for these drawings. So images and containers, uh, people confuse those in Dockers and it is a little bit confusing because they're kind of the same thing, but they're used differently. An image is like the pristine image of a container. And a container is a running instance of that image. So you have one image, you may have three different containers running with that same, from that same image. Uh, so think, in programming terms, think of it like the image is the class and the container is an instance of that class. Think of it that way. So you would build a Docker image and then the thing that you actually run is a container, which is based on that image. So you'll, you'll hear image and container thrown around a bit when you deal with Docker. I will probably mix them up here and there as, as we go along as well. But that's what those things are. So that's Docker, images and containers. There's a tool with Docker called Docker Compose. And here we have an elephant conducting music to represent Docker Compose. Uh, if you ever watch 12 Tones on YouTube, it's, it, it's a very good thing. Uh, uh, Docker Compose is like an orchestrator for Docker. It's where you can orchestrate one or more uh, uh, containers and run them in a particular way with a particular configuration. It is a convenience tool. You, there's nothing Docker Compose does that you couldn't do by hand with some scripting and a really long Docker commands, but you don't want to. Docker Compose handles and abstracts away some of the ickiness for you. And Docker Compose is generally used when you have more than one container you want to run. I will use it even for just one container because it it simplifies a, a lot of things for you. It simplifies creating a container and removing the container when you're done with it. it. It simplifies a lot of things. So that's a little background. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Docker will install on just about anything as will Docker Compose. On Windows, uh, Docker Compose will come with Docker when you install it. On Linux, uh, you have to do a little extra handle jiggling, but uh, then you'll have Docker Compose. When they're installed, you should just be able to go Docker-V 
and docker compose dash v and you, it should be able to find those and and tell you what version you're running so once you have that set up you're ready to get started uh, docker has something called docker hub and it's where there are pre-built docker images for just about anything you can think of and anybody can put an image on there there's stuff with PostGIS on there uh, there's an official Postgres repository. Uh, hat tip to M. Dillon, because uh, I got a lot of ideas from looking at how he used the official Postgres uh, Docker image and put PostGIS on top of that. And it could be you find an image on Docker Hub that does everything you need to do. And that's the ideal scenario. For our production environment, uh, we need some extra stuff and weirdness so what i've done is built my own now to build your own docker image you need a docker file and docker file just has a particular format whenever you see a docker image kind of like what you want to do you can usually go to their github repo and see what that docker image they built looks like which is very helpful this is the one i built for our use and you can build a Docker image based on other Docker images. And here I'm using the official Postgres image, which I think uses Debian, like Debian, Jesse, Slim, or something. And I'm going to 11 because Spinal Tap, and that's what we turn it to. Now, one thing I'm doing in my Docker file, and I'm going to share all the code for this in the blog post. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can... See a link to the blog post in the description and see all that code there. By default, Docker images set to like UTC zero or, or some, you know, like time zone you're not in because I, 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 it just does. So here I'm setting an environmental variable. That's what the Z and v, v is and telling it time zone New York. And down here, I'm going to set the time zone. So then I'll be in our local time zone in case that's going to affect anything. It might not, but that's how, how you do that if, if you want to change the time zone on your Docker image. So first things first, I'm going to add Paul Ramsey's addressing dictionary because we use that. And this is one of the things I need my own image for because uh, nobody else really uses it. Well, I mean, a lot of people use this, but there's not a, a Docker hub image uh, that that had this built in so what I'm here doing here is this run command runs something on the docker image when it builds it so I'm telling it to make this folder and then I'm this copy command will copy something from your local files to the docker image itself so I'm taking a zip of the uh, addressing dictionary Paul built and I'm putting it on that Docker image to that in that folder we just made. So now the image is, or the uh, the addressing dictionary is there as a zip file. Now we're going to do the big run, and this is where you install all of the things and do the extra things you need to do. So I'm going to install PostGIS. I'm also going to install PG Routing, and a lot of the PostGIS instances or images on Docker Hub don't have PG Routing. We install PG routing and the PostgreSQL dev server. And these variables, some of these like PG major, these are set by the official Postgres uh, image. So when I tell it Postgres 11, it's setting 11 as the major version. And this PostGIS V, I'm setting here myself, I want 2.5. So I'm installing that. I'm also installing unzip and make for the addressing dictionary. And after that runs, I'm going to CD to where the addressing dictionary is, unzip it, CD into there, do a make install. And now I have the addressing dictionary as part of my image. all set up in the, the PostGIS contrib extension folder stuff. And then at the end, I'm gonna app get purge and remove these packages I don't need anymore like the dev server and make and unzip. So that is the big run and you'll see this on every Docker uh, config file you look at is the installing stuff. 
here again set the time zone now I'm going to add uh, a couple of scripts I'm going to add a backup script misspelled backup because that's how I roll uh, backup scripts I'm gonna make a folder I'm gonna copy the script again from my local script I have here into the image and then I'm going to make that script executable next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to add a database initialization script and this is uh, I'm going to make this folder and copy this local script into that image. This is a script, a bash script that will run once. It'll run the first time this image is uh, is instantiated. Uh, it'll run this and it'll run that script and it'll update all the data and anything else you want to do in that initialization script. Then finally, I'm sharing a volume to the opt backup folder. Because another thing you want to think about when you're making this kind of image is a Docker image does not persist changes to that Docker image in between runs. So if you have your data folder for Postgres running from within that Docker image, when the Docker image stops, all that goes away, which is no good. So we're going to take the data uh, folder for Postgres as well as our backups folder and have those be stored outside of that image. And there's two ways to store, uh, 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 to kind of link folders that way. You can do it as just a quick and dirty user folder or you can have Docker manage that as a named, uh, a named volume is what they call it. Now, for the Postgres data, you want to do that as a named volume. There's nothing magical, magical about that in terms of performance. You can actually go into the Docker folders and you'll see it's just there as a set of folders, whatever you shared. Uh, you do that because you want Docker to manage permissions on that folder. Because if you screw up the permissions on that, uh, your image, your Postgres is not going to launch. And you want that to go away if you have to rebuild that image. Because if you want to say upgrade Postgres or Postgres, remember what's in your image is not persisted. So to do that, you're gonna rebuild that image. When you rebuild that image, you're gonna now have new stuff that may not match what's in your persisted data folder. And Postgres will try to launch and go, sorry, this version doesn't match. And, and you're screwed, bud. So that's why you have that as a, a named volume that you let Docker manage. For your backups, you don't want to do that because you don't want your backups going away uh, if you need to rebuild that image. So your backups, you will store just as a user volume. And that way, Docker doesn't manage it and it just stays there. So we're going to have two shares out of our... Huh, I almost... It almost looks like a, a folder. Look at that. We're gonna one that Docker is gonna manage, and one that we are gonna manage. Yeah, I've just I should I should quit this gig and just just do art full time. So this is what this is for. This is we're telling it we're gonna have a volume opt backups that we're going to create on this Docker image. So there's our Docker file. We included a couple scripts in here. We can take a quick look at those. Our backup script is pretty straightforward. I'm just uh, getting every database in the Postgres database. For each one, I'm just doing a PG dump and putting the name of the database and the date on there. And then I'm deleting any backup that's more than seven days old because I don't want to uh, fill up my hard drive with these backups. If I haven't noticed it in seven days, does anyone care? Probably not. So this is the backup script for the database initialization script. Uh, we're going to get our PG user here. This is where I set all of the various things I want to tweak in uh, the Postgres config file. 
Now I'm doing this by uh, uh, alter system commands. I usually use this pgtune website where you can give it your OS and, and Postgres version and RAM and CPUs and what are you doing with it and your storage type. And it gives you these kind of best practice settings. These settings may not be perfect for you, but you know, tweak as you need. So there's where I set all those settings. Uh, you can create any additional users you want to here. Make your main database. Create your extensions in that database. And this is Paul's addressing dictionary I'm making here. Uh, another thing I have here is it says if the opts, opt backups folder has a restore.dump file, go ahead and restore that to the GIS database. So if I want to make a new instance, I can take my last GIS database backup, put it in that backups folder locally, and rename it to restore.dump. This initdb script runs once. It runs the first time this, this image is instantiated, and it will restore that database. Once it runs this ultra system set runs a script, it actually restarts Postgres, and you're golden. You've got all your data and, and everything ready to go. So those are our scripts. That's all of our Docker stuff, and I'm using Docker Compose to manage this. And Docker Compose uh, is a YAML file. So it looks like this, and we have one service in this Postgres service. We're saying the context is this local folder, and to use that Docker file we made, we're giving the image and container the same name and volumes. Here's where you can use Docker Compose to have a named volume for your Postgres data. We're setting up a volume here and giving it a name. Then for our volume, we're setting that name to the images varlib Postgres SQL data folder, where it stores all the data and configuration related stuff. So now this is persisted outside of the image. And our backups, we're just doing the happy local backup thing for our that way, this image is rebuilt. This, this sucker is going away. This backup folder won't. Uh, network thing I don't really need. I just have been there for laughs. We're setting up our internal and external port. And this environmental file.env. This is where you can set a lot of options that are part of the official Postgres image. I'm just setting the Postgres pack, password here to whatever I want it to be. So that's what your, your Postgres user password is going to be for, the, for your database. Start that up. You can just do docker compose up. And I think it's already going. Uh, let me actually close out of there. So we're going to stop that. Docker compose up runs that interactively. And what you can do is docker compose up dash D and it'll run it in the background. That's probably the way you want to do it, especially in production. And now our database is up and running. If you're running this for the first time, it has to build that image for the first time, install PostGIS and all the stuff. So it'll take a little bit longer. If you've already done that, it starts up extremely quickly. So we go to PG admin. It might be freaked out because, uh, we just stopped to start the server, see if this, yeah. There, just reconnected. Uh, here's our cities folder. We can see all of our stuff. So Postgres is up and ready, running and ready for production. So what else? We've got to be able to start this sucker when this machine reboots because Machines reboot sometimes, and sometimes you know about it, and sometimes you don't. So how are we going to do that? We also need to run backups, because we have a backup script there, but nothing is scheduled to run that. So I there's different ways to do this. I use cron. If you're setting running this in Windows and you're setting up a task there, you'd run the same sorts of commands. Uh, on reboot, I sleep for a little bit just in case there's something Docker needs that hasn't started up yet. Then I use the path to Docker Compose. Docker Compose by default uses the Docker 
compose YAML file in the folder you're at. If it's somewhere else, like this case, you do dash F and the path to that YAML file. And then I'm just doing up dash D. So that will start at reboot, start your Docker Compose process and start everything up. For your backups, you can run, I just run these daily. You can set up your backups however you want. Docker exec and the name of the Docker Compose name of the container that's set through Docker Compose and that script we put on there. So if we go, if we just run this from the command line, it is going to go off and run our backups. And we can look in that backups folder when it is done. And you'll see we've got a new backup from from today, from right now. So, yay us. So, that's how you run your backups and start your, your Docker Compose on boot. So, that's how, that's how I have it running in production. It's been really great. I can set up a whole new Postgres server that is identical to what we have in production in just a few minutes which is great if say the county explodes and i need to crank this up on like a digital ocean drop it really quickly which has happened before um so that, that's how you set up docker now i've talked about all the wonderful things and advantages there are a couple of disadvantages one of which if you need to change something about the docker image you're rebuilding that image, which is going to also get rid of your volume for Postgres, so you need to restore your data again. Because a Docker image does not persist any changes, the container that's running doesn't persist any changes back to that image. It is part of that container. It's gonna go away when that container stops. So you could, you can actually get to the command line of a running a container docker exec dash i dash t dress 11 dash post just do point five i think that's what it is in bash and now we're we're sitting uh we're, we're running this from the actual running docker container but if i install something this way like if pg routing was not part of my original image i installed it here it would actually run while this container was running and work like it's there. But if I have to stop and start this container, it's gone. So that's something to be aware of. And it's really not that big of an inconvenience. On bare metal, it's a little more convenient to say upgrade minor versions of Postgres because it'll usually handle that for you and you're fine. Whereas here you have to rebuild a new image which is not hard, it's just something you need to be aware of. But that's about it for the disadvantage. Advantages, everything else has been gravy and it has been running great for a month and a half, no hiccups. And it runs, part of this was I upgraded from Postgres 10 to 11 and Postgres 2.4 to 2.5. Uh, and it runs wicked fast. Been very happy with both of those things. Anyway, all these configuration files will be in the blog post and that is how you set this sort of thing up and it's something I would highly recommend. I can take the last backup from our production server and on my machine at home I can just do docker compose up and I can have not a similar and identical setup as I do in production uh, from home or from a digital ocean droplet or from wherever you want and that is super handy and convenient i hope you found this helpful i will catch you later bye bye